Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have the pleasure of being between you and the closing ceremony and the bar. Uh, so uh, I guess it's better than being between you and lunch or something, but uh, at least there's something very awesome at the other side and an opportunity for us to hang out and chat a little bit more. So this is my title, uh, but to start off, I want to ask you a question. Uh, do any of you know where this is? Maybe someone has been here, even? I'm hearing some noises at the back. Correct. This is Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, this is where my agile journey starts. Uh, I was originally in product management, uh, did a bunch of interesting things through that, uh, and then at some point, uh, some folks found me and asked me if I wanted to go and hang out here. Does anyone know where this is? <laughs> Nobody knows where this is? Stockholm. Correct. This is Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, so basically the idea was I was hanging out in the nice sunny warm weather in South Africa. Uh, it's typically around 30 degrees in the summer. Uh, and instead, I swapped that for the cold and darkness. Uh, I spent four and a half years at Spotify uh, during the crazy time when things were growing uh, kind of like wild. Uh, some of my stories today are based a little bit on this, uh, but also I have done some other things since then, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about those in a minute. To give you a bit of context, though, uh, a lot of this stuff kind of comes from this thinking of uh, seeing a company grow from around 700 when I joined to being just shy of 5,000 people four and a half years later when I left. Now, aside from that being an impressive hiring feat, it's also kind of crazy from an organizational perspective. Things are just nuts. You don't have a lot of time to keep things kind of the wheels on. Everything is just moving really, really quickly. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story to kind of set the stage of this, because over the time uh, since I joined Spotify, I spent a lot of time traveling around at conferences, meeting people like yourselves. Uh, and this story, I think, captures a little bit of my experience of that. So, I hope all of you uh, like chicken, or at least some of you uh, like chicken. Uh, but the story goes that a young kid is watching their parents uh, cooking some dinner. And for those of you who have children, you know, of course, that a kid's favorite question is to ask, why? Why do you do that? And the kid notices at some point that the parents cut a little bit off the one end of the chicken as they put it into the pan and put it into the oven. Sort of parents look at each other and they say, well, actually, I have no idea. This kid is asking a question that we don't know the answer to. How did it come about that we were doing it this way? Well, we learned this from our parents. So they go ask the grandparents. They don't know either. Uh, and for the sake of a good story, the great-grandparents are alive as well. Uh, so they go and visit them. And immediately upon asking this question, why do you cut this piece off the chicken, the grandparents, great-grandparents at least, pack out laughing. And they say, well, my dears, uh, when we got married, uh, we didn't have so much money. Uh, our oven and our house were both quite small, and so the only way to fit the chicken in the pan, you know the rest of the story. Cut a little piece off, right? So what you find out has happened, basically, is that many generations down the line, you still have this kid who is going to learn how to cut a piece off the chicken for a reason that no longer exists, right? Now, I think this is a little bit of a metaphor for a lot of what I see organizations doing is that we copy and paste things from other companies, something that Spotify is doing, Google, Facebook, whoever, and we pull it into our organization without first asking the question, well, what is our oven actually looking like? What is the size of our pan? Yeah? So why is this important? I put this question up there, perception, because part of what we're talking about here is our perception uh, of this oven. And for many of you, if you go through the, the hiring process or if you look at the company's marketing, uh, usually the story tells you that the company, everything, the oven, uh, is very shiny, it's brand new, there's all of these great bells and whistles, everything is very modern, we use the latest technology, we've got the most agile process in the world, everyone is autonomous, all of these things. But the reality is that often our perception, once you arrive inside the organization, is a little bit different. Yeah? Maybe you've seen this before. Perhaps. This is a little bit more what we look like, right? You spend a bit of time. It's not to say that this is necessarily good or bad. It's just a different way, right? Alternatively, maybe after you've spent a few years, or maybe you've made an unfortunate decision of which company to go with, perhaps you find out 
that it looks a little bit more like this. <laughs> and maybe certain times it looks like this, right? Now, why am I talking about perception? Uh, why is it important that we understand how the company actually functions? Well, the reality is that all three of these are very great devices for cooking, but the things that you can make with them and the things that will be easy to make work quite differently, right? I don't know how many of you have tried to do pizza in a microwave oven. Yeah, not so good, right? You want to heat something in a hurry, or maybe you prefer to make a pizza, you use the appropriate systems, the appropriate technology. Right. So, this brings me to this question. How do we move beyond copy-paste agile? If we want to get away from this space where we run the risk of just grabbing and borrowing things that don't necessarily match the needs of our organization, we have to ask this question. How do we move beyond it? So, today I want to explore this through three different lenses. Systems, how do the parts fit together? Science, how do we learn and validate what's actually working? And finally, sapiens, the wonderful world of humans and our incredible diversity. So, let's jump straight in. So the idea with systems, is it possible to get, I can't see the slides here, so I'm looking, cool. So the idea here basically is we want to talk about uh, the connections between all of the different flight levels, or the interactions between the flight levels. Jose Casal was talking uh, earlier today. He did a little bit of an uh, introduction to flight levels and talked about some of the things around flight items and routes and so on. Uh, and I want to share with you just a little piece uh, of some of the things that I think are important to think about in this space. So very often when I work with an organization, the reality is that it looks a little bit like this. Uh, whether we're a coach, a software developer, manager, product manager, it doesn't really matter. We get pulled from one team to the next. There's thousands and thousands of things on the go. It becomes a little bit of a challenge to figure out what's actually important. So you may be wondering, well, why does this happen? Uh, and the reality is that quite a lot of what we do as individuals, as managers, and as leaders in the organizational space is that we look at a picture like this, right? And essentially what we're doing is we're saying, do you see there between those two cars at the back, there's actually space for another car? we could totally be more efficient, right? So we need some ways to be able to overcome this habit. We do it. I'm reading too many books at the moment. I have side projects and all kinds of things that I want to do, black backlogs, you know, enough to fill more than the pockets in these pants, right? The reality is that we tend to, as human beings, it's not just the managers of the leaders' fault, it's the organization and the human sort of tendency. So let's look at this scenario. Uh, a typical team works on a board something sort of like this, uh, and you have something uh, kind of like some external weighting, a few bits and pieces on the go. You've all seen something a little bit like this, some sort of scrum board, Kanban board, something like this, yeah? So the question for me is, well, what happens when things arrive in done? The reality is that they're not actually done. There's several hidden steps in this process, right? And maybe there's something like waiting for integration if we take a software development view. Uh, Maybe, also, some acceptance, perhaps even a few other things. There we go. Right? So the reality is that these things have to happen before the work arrives and done. So it's not just done in our space, we actually need to get it somehow out to the customer. The reality, of course, we don't do these things as often uh, as we are developing software. I can make changes every single day, a couple of times if I want. But maybe once a month we do the integration, once a quarter uh, we actually ship it out to our customers. But the good news is that at least then, once we arrive at the done column, it is done. Of course, we should also look at the other end. Where does the work come from? Where do these ideas originate? And in most cases, this is just simply the development backlog. It's just the work that this team does, right? If we go a little bit further, we start to see maybe a product backlog, some analysis work, and if we go even a little bit further, maybe we find out where the ideas come from. There's some approval teams, some committees, some budgeting, some decision-making, all of these kind of things are happening. You recognize this a little bit? Yeah? The challenge, and Jose showed you uh, part of this story uh, earlier as well, is when you zoom out, what you start to see is actually a really very, very long process. Lots and lots of things not happening on a very, very agile cycle. 
And most of our focus is here on the development stage, as if making the teams type faster. That's the magic, right? If we could just type and produce code quicker, make marketing campaigns, do the hiring faster. But as you can start to see, the benefit, yeah? Super fucking agile in that step, but at the end of the day, not actually, yeah? I won't go into too much detail on this, but basically the short version of it is essentially you're seeing some small spaces here where the working is actually being done. Uh, most of the time, however, we're waiting, waiting for somebody else to do something, waiting for the next thing to be able to start. So the first point that I want to make here is to visualize the end-to-end -end flow. The idea here is quite simple, is that if you're not thinking all the way from the beginning of where the idea starts to where it delivers some useful value, vision to value or concept to cash, Maybe you've heard these kind of catchy phrases. If you're not able to see that, it's unlikely that you're going to be actually optimizing for effective business flow or a business agility. Yeah? So we need to first be able to see the full flow. Another piece of this challenge uh, is that how many of you have only one team in your organization? Does anybody have? It's very rare, I think. You're usually only one, maybe two people, if that's the case. But the reality is that as our organization grows, what we tend to do is we create teams that specialize around certain things, right? So we have a group of people who do the marketing, somebody else does the hiring, maybe even different parts of the software development stack. And as the company and the organization grow, we tend to specialize even further, and so we make teams for each key on the keyboard, right? Now, the reality is that as a result of this, our challenge doesn't become how fast can the A team push the A key, you know, you can push it as fast as you want, melt the keyboard, doesn't matter. The challenge here is coordination between the teams. Because as the customer wish at the top here says, if the customer wants a love letter, what we want is something that involves pushing the right keys at the right time. Yeah? It's not about how fast can I push the key. Right key, the right time. Of course, a lot of this is about feedback loops. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides in the entire presentation. Basically, you want a healthy dose of this every breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But of course, there is a point where you can end up with too much feedback, right? You can have too many meetings, too many conversations. Things take too long or sometimes even too early, right? It's a bit of a balance. We have to find a good, a good approach to this. One way that I like to look at this is to think about it as if this picture, it's a little bit dark, but maybe you can see it. Essentially, what we're looking at here is the same actual item, but depending on where we look at it from, we see different perspectives, right? So if you think about it as the green side of this, this is maybe, say, the operations perspective, you know, the detail on the ground, exactly what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And maybe, if you think about from the blue perspective, this is the strategic view, the high-level view, looking at the full organization. And in addition to this, we have coordination, the part that ties it all together, those feedback loops and those kind of connections between the teams, as we were talking about earlier. So you saw some of this picture, for those of you who saw Jose's talk. Uh, but basically, the idea behind flight levels here is that we're trying to create the appropriate connections between the different levels of the organization, but also horizontally right, and vertically throughout the organization. Not just, does my team know what to do after your team is done, but how does it connect, as Jose explained? How do we actually decide? When I have this question, I've run into some issue, I cannot proceed, where do I go to find the answer to whether I should proceed with this thing or the other one? So the idea here basically is that what we want to try to connect is the parts of the organization at the appropriate time. Remember this phrasing of the right key at the right time, or the right team doing the right thing? at the right time. So what I want to challenge you to with this is to say that what we have to do here is we have to go beyond just thinking about the team level. It's one thing to say, well, we coach this team and they perform really well, but my experience, and specifically at Spotify, the team lifespan tended to be relatively short. When you're growing that fast, you add some new people, you split a team, company strategy changes, right? You've just got the team working, and now they're broken up into new constellations, people gone off to do something else, somebody got promoted, somebody quit and went to a new company. All kinds of things are changing, right? So it doesn't help if we focus only on making the team function. 
we actually need to make the teams of teams and the full company an organization function. And specifically, we do this, as I said, by connecting the strategy to the operations. And we're using flight levels to make this visible. So if we want to start with this piece about systems, really, there's two main things that I want you to take away from this piece. Visualize your end-to-end -end flows, yeah? all the way from concept to cash, and connect your strategy to operations. Visualize the different levels of abstraction within your organization, and design the feedback loops that are necessary to keep those coordinated and in sync. If you're interested to read more about this particular topic, three books that I can suggest. Uh, I will make the slides available as well, but for those of you who prefer just to take a photo. Uh, Donella Meadows, Thinking in Systems, fantastic book if you want to learn anything about systems. It's really written as kind of a primer. Uh, you don't have to have a lot of knowledge about systems before you start. And what I like especially is she gives a lot of examples from different types of systems. It's not just talking about software development or business. Uh, forestry, environmental affairs, politics, government, cities, everything. Really, really fantastic book. Jose also talked about Rethinking Agile. Uh, this is Klaus Leopold's book. It's kind of the story of the invention of flight levels and how it came about uh, through a company that is going on this journey. And lastly, polarity management. Uh, the subtext of this one is solving unsolvable problems. Very often, we deal with this pendulum effect of things swinging. We centralize, and then we decentralize as the solution. He offers some great metaphors and tools for understanding how to balance this a bit better. So we've talked about systems, how things fit together. Let's talk about science, or as I've called this here, observation and experimentation. So a Back to the team board, you saw this earlier. Uh, you could imagine that it's somehow a similar sort of a team. Uh, the question that we're trying to ask here is, well, what happens when the thing actually is in done? So it's now the green done, it's gone through the entire flow, uh, and we have reached done, right? The question, of course, is, are we focusing here on outputs or outcomes? And very often, when we're shipping something from a company perspective, or hiring a person, running a marketing campaign, whatever it is, the reality is that what we're hoping for is an outcome, and what we've measured and incentivized for is the output. So I've delivered the software, but nobody used it. It doesn't really help so much, yeah? We hired those people. Turns out we had to fire them six weeks later because we hired the wrong people, yeah? We need to be able to address these issues. We need to focus on the outcomes. Part of the challenge is that I think very often what we do as human beings is that we're very, very bad at extrapolating. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the webcomic XKCD. Uh, it is fantastic. Uh, but this kind of thing is common all over the place. We, we tend to take in strange data and make weird extrapolations from it. Another part of it is that very often our plans for achieving the results that we are looking for, um, if you know the underpants gnomes from uh, South Park, uh, the big problem is that we have this idea that we're going to do something in this case, collecting underpants, and in phase three, we're going to profit, but we have this giant question mark, this chasm in the middle, um, as we were talking about earlier. How do you cross this chasm, right? Part of the challenge, I think, with this is that as human beings, uh, as Jonathan Haidt talks about in this wonderful book, is that we think of ourselves as being a kind of a logical processor, right? We think we look at the data, we analyze it, and then we come to a conclusion. But the reality is that actually most often what we're doing is we're making a decision and we're using our rational ability to explain why we made that decision. So we make it instinctively first, based on our gut reactions, based on our prior knowledge and biases, and then we use the rational ability to explain why we made it. Yeah? Annie Duke talks about this wonderful concept uh, of resulting, is our tendency to assess the effectiveness of a decision based on the result that it achieves. The analogy here is a game of poker. If I win, often, I must therefore be a good poker player. It's not something that we consider that perhaps I just got lucky. Or maybe the person I play against, they don't have very much experience, right? Too often, we end up in a situation where we assume based on the result rather than what actually happened. We need to start to separate these out a little bit. My proposal to you is very simple. 
And the challenge with something that is as simple as this, write your hypothesis and reflect. It's hard to do this well. It's hard to do this consistently, right? The reason I'm encouraging you to do this is because if you write down your ideas before you start working on them, you have the opportunity to reflect, and what you find as a different result, this is the opportunity for learning. The difference between what you expected and what you actually get. Yeah? One way to think about this, if you're trying to write your hypothesis, is to quite simply think, what would the effect of this thing be if we had it today? Right? How much money would it make? How many people's lives would it save? What would the impact on the company, the customers, or the employees be? Yeah? You could also look at it from this lens and say, what assumptions would have to be true in order for this to work? And that can lead you to all kinds of interesting discoveries. Right? Very often, the underpants get caught here, because the thing that would have to be true is that the plan would have to work, but we don't have a plan. Right? If you have to invent a magic machine uh, that just produces a result, probably you need to think a little bit through what some of your assumptions are. So, as we said, quantify your hypothesis before you start and reflect as you go. Then, of course, we have to ask this question, well, what happens after you've delivered? Or what happened, at least, after you delivered? Now, the reality is that very often we're in this situation, as I showed you this picture earlier, uh, we're basically saying there's still space, right? I understand this, right? Uh, as human beings, if I'm running a department and I did only one thing for the entire year and that thing didn't work, I'm going to have a much harder time explaining why I did only one thing than if I did six things and maybe we got lucky. Yeah? So, my proposal to you is this idea of don't let number three block number one. We use this quite extensively at Spotify as this kind of mantra for saying, let's be clear on what number one is, and then let's also be clear that the idea is that the reason we picked it as number one is that it should get a fast track over number two. That doesn't mean it always has to jump ahead, but if we're in a situation where I could do something, right, I'm working on number one, and you need help uh, on number two, I should say, sorry, I'm not going to help you because I'm working on the more important thing. But if the roles were reversed, yeah, I should switch, and we should help each other. Yeah? So we want to be clear on what is number one in addition. How many of you have done prioritization where you get a list of six things that are all number one? <laughs> you have this? Yeah? Or better yet, you get six different lists from six different departments, all with a number one? You've had this variation too? So the solution, let me go back one slide. So basically what we want to try to do here is to avoid making those traffic jams, right? What we have to do is we have to acknowledge that there are many different conflicting priorities. So the way we were handling this here, if you look on the top right here, uh, there's a set of things called current bets. Essentially, these are the high-level priorities. You could use OKRs, objectives, something like this. But the top right ones are sequenced, number one through number six. And as we talked about already, this idea of don't let number one be blocked by number three. So don't let number three block number one. This idea helps us to be able to make those decisions. Yeah? So, we're talking about science, and I've given you two suggestions here. First, quantify your hypothesis, write it down, and then use it to reflect and learn as you go. And secondly, don't let number three block number one will help you avoid making some of those traffic jams, or if you have them already, at least not make them worse. Yeah? If you'd like some recommendations on things to read on this topic, uh, three books that I can suggest. Uh, the two on the right side I already talked about in a bit more detail, uh, but the one on the left is called make, uh, Escaping the Build Trap uh, by Melissa Perry. A fantastic book around product strategy and decision-making processes, how you can actually build a framework for aligning your organization towards a healthy direction when you don't know exactly what you need to build, which is generally the case in product management. Right? Highly, highly recommend this book. A bug in my slides. <laughs> so, the 
final topic is around sapiens, uh, or the wonderful wor world of human diversity. So, how many of you have heard this phrase? How many of you have said this phrase? Maybe I'll ask you to be even more. Yeah, you've heard or said this phrase? Uh, or maybe you've also heard this version of it. Uh, it's not exactly the same phrase, but it's kind of similar, right? People resist change, or they won't work, or they won't work on that thing unless we tell them, right? The challenge for me with this is that what it tends to make an assumption out of here, or what it's assuming, uh, is that if it's about me, that I am lazy, stupid, or unmotivated, right? Now, I want to put it to you that, really, if there's some sort of dead wood, if you will, inside your company, there's only two ways that it got there. Either you hired dead wood, or you hired live wood, and you killed it. That's the only way it gets there. Yeah? Both of those are the responsibility of you as the people inside the company to address this. And you have the tools to do this, right? So, why does this happen? Why do we constantly keep killing people or killing their energy, their motivation, their desire to be able to do stuff? Part of the challenge, I think, is that very often when we think about an organization, we think about people, we think about systems, we tend to think about them like this very mechanistic machine models, right? One part can be swapped out for another. One developer leaves, we hire a new one, yeah? QA left, we promote somebody from a junior role. Something like this. We interchange people. The reality is that human beings are not like that, right? Um, it just doesn't work that way. I think a better metaphor for thinking about this kind of stuff is to think of a forest. Think of an ecosystem, right? There's no amount of motivational posters and KPIs and so on that is going to make this forest grow. You can't instruct it and do a quarterly performance appraisal or something along these lines, right? I joke, but people do this. They do this with human beings all the time, right? What we need to be doing is thinking about when do I plant? Just enough sunlight, but not too much. The right amount of water, but not too much, yeah? It's much more of a balance and working with the system than it is about any kind of management directly or just kind of directing everything, yeah? Can anyone tell me what's going on in this photo? Does anybody know what this is? Is this the abortion thing? So it, it, was, it was actually a little bit before this, but probably related. So uh, this is Mike Pence, the, at the time the Vice President uh, of the United States, uh, and this is Donald Trump's counsel. They're in, re, responsible for women's rights. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but there is just no possible way that this group could make a good decision. <laughs> Putting the politics aside, the people who are affected by the issues that they're talking about are just not in the room. Right? This is a very common challenge that we face. Right? One other factor. Can anyone tell me what's going on here? Maybe you know the story. What's happening in this picture? Maybe you have a guess. The rocket launch. The rocket launch. So, I'll be honest, the first time I saw this picture, I did not think a rocket launch. I was thinking more, maybe it's a graduation, a wedding, something like this, All right? You'd be forgiven for thinking that, I think, because the point I'm trying to make here is that we have biases, right? This is actually a group of scientists who are celebrating the successful launch of a Mars lander. It's the Indian Space Agency. The spaceship is called the Mangalayan. Uh, and what they managed to do was successfully put a spaceship on Mars for less than Hollywood made the movie The Martian. <laughs> they did it on their first attempt, and they did it cheaper, a tenth of the cost of what anybody else has done it before or since. It is an incredible feat of engineering, and a huge quantity of the team who made up that group are women. But when we think of scientists and we see this picture, 
they don't tend to align with each other, right? So why is this? Why do we do this? Well, millions of years ago, uh, if you were wandering around in the bush, uh, as many of our ancestors would have been uh, on probably the plains of Africa, something uh, yellow jumps out the bush and it's coming towards you and you go, well, it looks yellow, it's moving quite fast, it's coming in my direction, it looks fairly hungry, I don't know. Take that long to think about it, you're already lunch. Right? In order to survive, we adapted the ability to make a fast fit pattern match rather than a best fit pattern match. We don't think about whether it's a lion, we just run the hell away. Yeah? This is highly, highly effective in making us survive lion attacks, but it's problematic when we're talking about hiring or any of the, the, the pictures that I showed you earlier. So, if we acknowledge that we have biases, and I'm not going to lecture you for a long time about the biases themselves, what I think we need to do is we need to find ways to intentionally design around these biases, right? Somebody thought it was a good idea for a bunch of men to get in a room and make, get in a womb, ironic, uh, slip of the tongue, but get in the room and make decisions about women's reproductive rights, yeah? Sorry. And it's the same thing in a company situation. We need to bring together these different perspectives. Neither one of these is better than the other, and none of them should win all the time. But if we don't consider operations, coordination, and strategy, and blend it together, we're going to run into some challenges. Yeah? Another thing you could do is you could consider, well, if you're all men, or all product managers, all senior leadership, all only Finnish, all South African, all bearded people, whatever you choose, yeah? Invite some people who are different into the mix, right? Start there. Representation is the first part of this challenge, but is by no means the last. So if you've addressed this, you would probably change the situation so it doesn't feel like this when you meet the leader, right? Neither of those is probably feeling very good about that situation, to be honest, right? It's not just problematic on the right, it's problematic on the left, too. Same thing, making suggestions, yeah? Maybe your retrospective feels like this. Certainly restructures can often feel like this. And I don't know about you, but performance reviews can very often feel a little bit like this, yeah? And again, I emphasize the point. We focus a lot on this side. It's also problematic for the people on this side. As a manager doing performance reviews, I don't want to feel like this towards you as we do this. We need to change that balance. So we talked about blending these different perspectives together. Operations, strategy, and coordination. One way I like to think about this is if you think about diversity as being invited to the party, so addressing the representation side of this challenge, inclusion is choosing the music, yeah? It's not enough to simply invite a bunch of other people into the conversation and then have them sit quietly, not able to contribute, or not feeling welcome to contribute, yeah? We have to address the other side of this. So, I have two quick examples for you. The first one here, this is actually from a quarterly check-in style conversation that we would have with some of the teams, and I've used this in a couple of different organizations. Uh, basically, the thing that I want to draw your attention to is actually the last three. So, quite simply, the agenda was we're having a feedback conversation, and to avoid it being just that sort of sumo wrestler against the kid, what have you achieved or learned since we last met? Right? What are you planning to do next? What's on our minds? So, me as the sort of the junior leader, what's on my mind? What am I stressed by or what are we stressed by? And very importantly, the final one, and which do I need or want help with? The reason for that last one specifically is that we noticed a tendency for especially leaders uh, to assume that if you told me you had a challenge for something, that meant you wanted my help. I can't remember who it was that said it earlier, but very often what we tend to do is we're actually inflicting help. And what we want to do is rather ask the question and say, maybe you want help with a different thing, or maybe what you want help with is in a totally, totally different way. 
Yeah? Simply asking the questions in this way can be helpful. Another one. I don't know how it is uh, for you in Finland, if that's even a fair generalization to make, but my experience is a lot of companies tend to have a strong bias towards one of these two, right? The challenge is that whichever one you're using, that biases towards a certain set of people who have a preference for that type of communication and against the others, right? So a simple thing that I like to offer is to try pre-reading if you bias a little bit more towards the left side than towards the right side that you're probably on. Offer some pre-reading, give people some time to think about what you've shared with them, the proposal, the slide deck, the discussion, the ideas, and then follow up to have a conversation in whatever form, written, verbal, a conversation, something like this. Yeah? Just going through these three steps helps to avoid a situation where you're only biasing towards people who want to say, I don't know how often you've seen this, uh, announcement about some new strategy change. At the end of it, I say, any questions? Within three seconds, nobody said yes or raised their hand. So, okay, cool, thank you very much, and we move on with the next thing. Yeah? We want to try to get out of that. So, if you want to dig into this topic a little bit more, uh, three books that I can recommend. Uh, Esther Derby, hopefully all of you know about her already. Uh, read this and all of her other books. It's fantastic. Uh, seven Rules for Productive Positive Change, or Positive Productive Change. In the middle, Liz Wiseman, uh, the book is Multipliers. Uh, it taught me a lot of things about how certain of my strengths can actually be problematic in certain situations, and how to match my strengths to the right situation, but also when to help others to step forward into a leadership role. It's got a fantastic table, a lot of really interesting ideas in this book. Highly, highly recommend it. The last one, Humble Inquiry, Edgar Schein. Uh, if you have questions about how to help and how to ask good productive questions, this is a fantastic, fantastic book. Uh, he has another one as well called Helping, which is also fantastic. So, I put this question to you at the beginning. How do we move beyond copy-paste agile? And I hope that what we've done is we've talked a little bit about some of the challenges with just borrowing pra practices and ideas from other companies without really thinking through what of, what of our current situation actually needs those things and to develop a better understanding and perception of how our company functions. So we talked about three different lenses in this case, right? We have systems, right? The interactions and feedback loops across the flight levels, how everything all fits together. We talked about science, right? How do we shift from output to outcome-focused and think a little bit more about how we're learning and reflecting as we go? And finally, sapiens. How do we design around our biases and leverage the wonderful power of human diversity? So this, for me, is how we create uh, the missing links between strategy and operational agility, right? We want to move beyond copy-paste agile, as we said, and start to build those links by enabling people to be able to participate in a much larger percentage of the useful conversations that are on the go. If you're tired of this situation, and I think that perhaps from the show of hands earlier, perhaps many of you are, uh, I can offer you one or two things as some ways that we could help. Uh, the Flight Levels Academy has an Introduction to Flight Levels course. Uh, it's relatively cheap. Uh, if you jump onto this website uh, and have a look, uh, you can explore the concept of flight levels a little bit deeper, uh, and maybe it is helpful uh, to you in your situation. Additionally, uh, we have a free stream on YouTube. Uh, we have been a little bit quiet for this, this year, but last year we did uh, every two weeks. We spoke to different leaders um, and different people who are doing things with flight levels and exploring interesting topics and ideas. It's all on YouTube, and you can jump on Meetup if you'd like to watch it live in the future. Last thing I will say to you is perhaps presenting a little bit of a counter-argument. I often hear this uh, from people when I talk about these ideas. You know, coaching, teaching, investing in our people, all of this, it's, it's expensive, right? Have you heard something like this before? Yeah? So, Basically, what I hear as the hidden question inside this, or the hidden concern, is that what if we invest in people and they leave? And I want to leave you with a thought, which is, what if you don't? 
and they stay. Yeah? That's me. I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. It's probably the best place to find me. Uh, I'd love to chat to you uh, over a beer or whatever beverage you prefer at the after party. Uh, but reach out to me. I'd love to hear what you're up to, what you thought about this. Uh, maybe we have time for one or two questions. And awesome. that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting. That was awesome. Thank you for inviting a non bearded person. <laughs> Diversity right here. Like that?